Today, as we come to the table. I know this was a rare case where Paul may not ever see them again. What amazes me is Paul's diligence to go and Paul's diligence to do and the diligence of the people to hear and be a part of it. Guys, how we need to have those hearts in America today. We need to have a fire and a burn to be diligent for the things of the Lord and to be into the things of the Lord and be into his word and into worship and into prayer. And if we're not, let's be honest about it. Let's not pretend that we are. Go to the Lord and tell him, God, I'm not into your word like I need to be. And I don't really want to read it like I should want to. Just be honest. He knows that. I can't admit that to God, that I really don't want to read his word anymore. I can't tell him that like he doesn't know. God knows you. He sees and knows everything. So if there's one thing he can handle, it's the truth. Pastor Mark reminds us today that we can bring the truth to God no matter what it is. And when we bring the truth that we aren't as into the things of God as we would like to be, he can do his work in us. He can take our apathy and turn it into a hotly burning fire for his word. Well, thanks for taking the time to join us as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Mark Kirk, senior pastor of Calvary Knoxville. So if you look at your life and notice that you're not as on fire as you used to be, take Pastor Mark's advice today and bring that truth to God. Let him work in your heart to reignite that flame and then watch what he does in and through you. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Acts chapter 20 as he continues his message, Diligent to Serve. Now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Now, again, some of you might think I'm long-winded from time to time. But I don't think I've ever continued on the Sunday morning service until midnight. This was a long service. And again, look at Paul's diligence to do. And not just Paul's diligence to do. I'm not saying we should have services that, that go until midnight. That's not my point. I'm saying look at Paul's diligence to teach the Word of God to the people of God, even to the point of exhaustion and even way past what would be even halfway accepted here in America. And what is also interesting to me is not just the diligence of Paul to feed them and teach them the Word, not knowing when he would see them again, but the diligence of the people to listen. Can you imagine if you guys, if I said, okay, today, surprise, we're here, but it's going to be a three-hour service. You know, I'd be like, well, you might be here three hours, but I'm out of here, right, for lunch, right? Because that's the American mindset. But guys, how diligent are we to hear the Word of God? Are we more concerned about when the service is over, or what is God saying to me this morning? This is not to beat us up, it's to wake us up. As you know, Malad and Trace were in Egypt, and they were at a service there in Egypt they told me about right before they came to America. They had a 12-hour worship service where they stood the entire time. I'm not suggesting that. I don't know that Americans can handle that right now. What I'm saying is, what is our mindset? Is our focus, how long is this? When is this done? Or how do I find the Lord? How do I draw in close to Him? How do I spend time with Him? You know, it's interesting. We're going to see that Paul goes so long here in just a moment that this guy, you know, we're going to see (laughs) ends up falling out of the window here and and, and dying. You can say there's one thing, I've never taught so long I've killed some of you. (laughs) You may have felt like you were dying, but I've never killed you. I heard a a story about a guy that walked into a church and in the foyer they had all these pictures all over the walls of a bunch of people. And the guy visiting said to the pastor, said, who are these pictures of? He said, well, these are pictures of people that died in the service. He said, really? First or second? (laughs) Because a lot of people feel that way when it comes to church. Because the bottom line is, where's our heart this morning? Did you come hungry? Are you wanting to hear God's voice? Here's the thing. It doesn't matter how good or bad a teacher I might be. If you've come to hear God, he's talking to you right now. And if you come to hear the Lord, he's speaking to you. Why? Because we're reading his word. This is how he talks to us. What is our diligence to get into the word? What is our diligence to share the word? Paul was diligent. Paul was always on the go. 
And so he's giving them the word. Now, there's something else to notice here. Notice it says, when they gathered together on the first day of the week. I want you to note that. Why? I don't want to make a big deal of it, but I want to say that as we pass these portions in Scripture. Because this is not the only place it talks about it. As a matter of fact, secular history says that the early church worshipped on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday. And why did the early church worship on the first day of the week as a congregation? Because that was the day the Lord resurrected. And so because the Lord resurrected on Sunday, the church began to worship on Sunday. And we see the indications from the very beginning of the early church all the way through church history, the church worshiping on Sunday morning. And I only say that because you're going to run into those who are going to say, well, you're in sin if you're worshiping on Sunday morning. We're supposed to be doing Saturday morning on the Sabbath. And if you do a Sunday morning, then you're somehow in sin. Well, not according to the scripture. Because Paul said every day is a day to worship the Lord. He said, let every man be convinced in his own mind. He said, I see every day alike. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to limit worship to the Lord on Sunday. I'd like to be able to sing a praise song on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'd like to be able to get in the word on Saturday. I'd like to do seeking the Lord throughout the week. So don't ever let anyone lay a trip on you. As a matter of fact, Paul said, don't let anyone do that. And when Paul was writing the church in Corinth, he said this, again, showing they were worshiping on Sunday. He said, now concerning the collection for the saints as I've given orders to the churches of Galatia. So not just you guys in in Corinth, but in Galatia. So you must do also, note this, on the first day of the week, i.e. Sunday, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that is, get ready for the offering, that there be no collections when I come. He didn't want to take a collection for the, the poor church in Jerusalem when he got there. He wanted them to be ready so it wouldn't look as though he was having to put that effort forth or just coming for their money, because Paul wasn't. He wanted to minister to the church in Jerusalem. He said, when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear the gift to Jerusalem. So worshiping on Sunday, that's how the early church did it. It would appear from scripture and secular history. Now notice this, as they're having their service, their group service on Sunday, look at verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. Now this is a clue. Why did he say many lamps? Because they're about to see this Eutychus uh, fall asleep and get killed during the service, as we said. That's a pretty major incident to take place during church. And I think the reason the Holy Spirit put many lamps here is probably because there was a lack of oxygen in the air from all these oil lamps burning, maybe even some gases that were being released from these oil lamps. And Eutychus is sitting up here in the window. Look at verse 9. And in the window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. (laughs) And he was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Now, if you guys fall asleep during this service, you got a lot shorter way to drop. Now, we would probably all notice it. That would be quite obvious. But you probably wouldn't be dead. Can you imagine at church someone suddenly dying? During the service, that would be pretty traumatic, wouldn't it? No doubt they were shocked and overwhelmed. But I would say this, if you're going to die at church, do it while Paul the Apostle's there. How about that? Because now we're going to see that God, again, using Paul in in his gift of miracles, is going to heal him and see him raised from the dead as he goes and he falls on him this. And again, just an amazing story here. So Eutychus falls out the window, he dies. But when Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him, no doubt praying for him and crying out to God for God to resurrect him, He said to them, do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. So God is resurrecting. He's going to be alive. And no doubt they went from, as we said, from shock to rejoicing. It is interesting to me, Eutychus, his name literally means fortunate. (laughs) And I would say, it's service with Paul. When you fall out the third story window and die, you're fortunate. Paul's there. So Eutychus lived up to his name. And when he had come up, he had broken bread and eaten. Now notice Paul's diligence here in doing the work. He talked a long while. Paul kept going, you know. You you would think, hey, somebody died, right? Maybe we should just kind of call this thing off. It's been a long night. We've gone to midnight. We already had a death, you know, resurrection. It's been a busy service. So why don't we go on home, get a good night's sleep. Notice what it says about Paul. It says, and Paul continued. He talked for a long while, end of verse 11, even till daybreak. And he departed. Paul brought the sun up teaching the word. Again, I'm not suggesting that we should do that. I know this was a rare case where Paul may not ever see them again. But what amazes me is Paul's diligence to go and Paul's diligence to do and the diligence of the people to hear and be a part of it. Guys, how we need to have those hearts in America today. We need to have a fire and a burn to be diligent for the things of the Lord and to be into the things of the Lord and be into his word and into worship and into prayer. And if we're not, let's be honest about it. Let's not pretend that we are. Go to the Lord and tell him, God, I'm not into your word like I need to be. And I don't really want to read it like I should want to. Just be honest. He knows that. I can't admit that to God, that I really don't want to read his word anymore. I can't tell him that like he doesn't know. He knows. 
I can't tell him I don't really want to worship, you know, that much more because, you know, I'm not really that much. He knows. But the Bible says we need to be growing in worship and growing in feeding on God's word and growing as believers. Go to him and be honest and God, here I am and you see me. I do not crave your word like I should. I do not crave worship like I should. I don't, I'm not where I need to be. So you know the truth. Here he is. Let's just talk it out. Change me. Give me a hunger for your word. Give me a hunger for worship. Make me a diligent believer. I want to do, I've, I've only got this many days. You know how many days I have, I have left. I don't know how many they are, but I know I've only got so many. God, let me use them wisely. And so, again, the challenge here, just watching Paul and his commitment. Now look at verse 12. They brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. That's the Bible's way of saying they were like, really, it was awesome. <laughs> Notice this. Now we come to the last thing. Lastly, we come to Paul's diligence to listen. And guys, note this. I believe this is the most important of the three. And why do I say that? Because if you answer the call to go, great. If you answer the call to do, great. But if you don't hear what God wants you to do, you're wasting your time. I think there's going to be a lot of believers in heaven that have done what they wanted to do for the Lord rather than what God wanted them to do for the Lord, and there's not going to be reward for it. Oh, they're saved. They're in the kingdom. God says, I didn't call you to teach. I called you to do this. I didn't call you to go into mission field. I called you to do this. I didn't call you. To, I called you to do this. Well, Mark, how do we know? Listen, you seek the Lord. He will give you joy in your heart for what it is he's called you to do, and then do it with all your heart. That's how you'll know. But if you're in somewhere where you go, this is what I want to do, but I haven't really heard God call me to do it, then seek the Lord and say, God, what is it you want me to do? I think one of the dangers of of young pastors, and you know, I remember being young when I first felt the call into the ministry. I kind of had some of these thoughts as well. But I think the danger of a young pastor is, I'm going to go to that town, and here's what I'm going to do. Okay, great. Why don't you now, once that's all out of you, now seek the Lord and find out what he wants to do. He already has a plan for Knoxville. He doesn't need you, Mark, to figure one out. Just go and find out what he's doing. Get in line with it. Do what he's called you to do in the midst of it and enjoy the ride. It's a lot like going down the river. And if you go to the river and say, you know what, I see the river. No, I think I'm going to take it that way. Well, if the water's running this way, you're going to have a really rough time. But if you just get in the boat and let the water take you and kind of just steer it and guide it following where the, the force of the water is leading... A lot sweeter ride, a lot easier ride, and you'll reach your destination not only not exhausted, but in the time you're supposed to reach it. Guys, the same thing is true when it comes to following the Lord. He told Paul, it's hard to kick against the goads, Paul. The goads are what they hit the animals with to get them to move forward. He said, you're kicking against me. Just give in, find my will for your life, and go with it. And now Paul's doing that, and he's doing it actually in a very diligent way, absolutely. Because again, This was the kind of person Paul was, and it's an encouragement to us. So now we come to, again, diligence in listening. Look at verse 13. It says, Then we went ahead to the ship, and we sailed to Assos, and intending to take Paul on board, note this, I have this underlined, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he met us at Assos, we met him on board, and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trigilium. The next day we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now why wanting to be there on the day of Pentecost? I don't think so much wanting to keep the feast in Jerusalem, which could have been a possibility with his Jewish culture and background, as much as he knew this is when all the Jews would be gathering. Jews from around the world gathered on certain feast days in Jerusalem. And if all the Jews from around the world are gathering at the day of Pentecost, Paul would want to be there. Or the day of any other feast, day of Pentecost or any feast, Paul would want to be there because he had a larger crowd and he could share the Lord and hopefully see his brethren, if you will, the Jews coming to Christ. So this was Paul's heart. It's what Paul wanted to do. But now what I wanted to point out here and what I want to focus on as we finish this last portion of listening to the Lord is verse 13 where he told them to go on in the ship. I'm going to walk. Look at that. For so he'd given orders intending himself to go on foot. You guys take the boat, which is the easy way. It's not that Paul wanted to purposely go a harder way and walk on foot. Paul needed some alone time to hear the voice of God. I believe that's exactly what's going on. It doesn't give us the details of what Paul was doing. But ministry gets very busy. 
And a lot of things happen. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of activity. And sometimes you've got to just break away and say, you know what? I need to be alone and hear the voice of the Lord. We saw Jesus do that. We would see him tell the disciples and take them to do that. Again, here now we see Paul doing that, getting alone to hear the voice of the Lord. Why? Because Paul knew no matter how much he goes and no matter how much he does, if he's not following the leading of the Lord and doing what God wants him to do, it's wasted time. So I believe what Paul was doing was spending time listening to the Lord. Now, again, you may not know this. You guys know that we went on vacation last week. You may not know that when we came back, I took a few extra days with a friend, and we went on a bike ride, over a 1,000-mile bike ride. Now, I'm not talking about bicycles pedaling, okay? We're talking about vroom, 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 right? He goes, well, a 1,000 miles, that's amazing. No, we're talking, I got to sit down. And... But let me tell you something. When you're on a bike ride like that, even if you're with someone riding, you're by yourself in the sense of it's you and just on that bike. And you've got a lot of time to think, and you've got a lot of time to pray, and you've got a lot of time to listen. And as I was writing and praying and thinking, God began to speak to me, but probably the greatest I heard God's voice was right before we got back. Now, here's the setting. We're coming back after a four-day ride. We've done the entire Blue Ridge Parkway, coming back, swooped around, and now we're getting to the, the final stretch. The weather has been fantastic. We had one little bit of rain coming into Asheville for a short amount of time. Wasn't too bad. Now, the final stretch, we're coming in what, again, bikers know, and you probably know this if you like to go up in the mountains, the Cherahala Parkway coming from Teleco. And then you finish the thing out with what they call the tail of the dragon. It's got like 318 turns, 11 miles. It's just like boo, boo, the whole way like this, right? And bikers love it because they can go in there and, and, and the younger ones, you know, are crazy. Uh, the older ones just kind of float in second gear like me. But anyway, it's a fun ride if you ride a motorcycle. But it's not exactly the kind of ride you want to do when you're tired and finishing four days of riding and a rainstorm starts. And as we started up the Chirahala and our final stretch of the ride on Thursday... We're getting up the mountain, and all of a sudden, here it comes. And I mean, it's a downpour. And the rain just, I'm thinking, oh, I don't believe it. And I would pull over, and we're already getting wet. We put on our rain gear. We hop back on, start going. And I immediately start praying. I said, all right, Lord, you know, we're at the home stretch. We have four days. We're exhausted. I think we rode something like 12 or 13 hours on that last day. It was, it was a long day. And so we're heading back over the final stretch where the two of the hardest portions of the entire ride, the Chira Hollow, which isn't that bad, but curvy and mountainy, and then, of course, the, the dragon coming in. And I'm thinking, Lord, you blessed us so much on the entire trip. Why do we come to this point right now? And suddenly, God, you know, I wasn't complaining, but I was just kind of wondering, why did you get us this far and let us get to the very last part and the hardest part, quite honestly? And then this big storm come in. I mean, I mean, I couldn't go back. At that point, if I drove back to miss the storm and go back down, it would have been longer going around, and we were already exhausted. The day had been hugely long. We had to stay on the road we were on. And I'm thinking, Lord, did, I, did we start this wrong? Or should we have gone a different way? What's going on here? And, and God began to speak to me. He said, what makes you think that just because there's rain, number one, you're on the wrong road, and just because there's rain that I'm still not blessing? I heard it as clear as day. I was like, whoa, whoa. You're right, Lord. This is the road home. It's the quickest way back. We can't really go back. You have been blessing us. Why would I think because it's raining, the blessings have stopped? And I started thinking, well, Lord, then, then let me know, you know what the blessing is. I want to see the blessing. And I remember we started riding. And I, I didn't realize I'd never ridden in rain. I hadn't been riding that, that long, and I hadn't ridden in the rain, really. And I found out that if you're riding a bike in the rain, you can't keep the visor down, at least not the kind that I have. Because it's so just, you know, muddled up with all the rain and the raindrops, you can't see anything. And unless you have clear vision, you're going to either you could hit something or drive off the road or wipe. You're going to have a big wreck, right? So I found out I had to pop my visor up. And so I'm driving with the rain smacking me in the face, getting soaked in my helmet. I was going, so this is a blessing, Lord, you know? And I'm, uh, right? And we got to the top of the mountain. It was just unbelievable. Huge puffs of clouds blowing across the road that you're driving. It's like, it was like driving in the sky at some points. And I remember just going, this is unbelievably awesome. And I totally forgot about the rain at that point because the view was so amazing. The ride was so thrilling. And God began to speak to my heart and said, you know what? If you don't go into the storms, if I don't send you into the storms, number one, just because you're in a storm does not mean you're not on the right road. But I send you into storms oftentimes to grow you and to show you greater blessings, things you would never see. You would never see what I'm showing you right now if I didn't let it rain some. And it was worth it. Now, if you'd have asked me before I got into the Chirahala and the Dragon, okay, would you like a big rainstorm at the end after all day riding in four days? No, I would say, no. But would I take it back now? Not on your life. Because of how God spoke to me and the beauty that I saw. Guys, here's my point. If you're following Jesus, you're on the right road. 
And you're going to get some rain from time to time. And it might even be miserable. You may have to pop up the visor and get soaked on the inside of the helmet thinking, Lord, where's the blessing in this? And how long does this last? Well, let me tell you something. God has a reason for it, and God is going to bless you in the midst of it. You stay faithful. You stay on the road that he's got you on. You, stay, you, you ride out the storm. You continue moving down that road. Don't retreat. Don't run back. You continue to head toward home. God's going to be faithful to get you there because that's the faithful God that we have. And I'll tell you something else God spoke to me because it was interesting. I thought, great, we made it over the Chirahala and the rain stopped, right? But the roads were all still wet. Well, guess what stood between us and Knoxville, right? The tail of the dragon, they called it. Again, it's not like it's something you can't do and it's so amazing or whatever, but it's a lot of twists and turns on a wet road in a motorcycle. And incidentally, we were almost the only ones on it. <laughs> See, other people had checked the weather. But anyway, we had to go that way, so I'm kind of being, being hard on us. Really, we, whether the weather was good or not, we had to continue on through if we're going to make it home. But I realized, Lord, now, you know, we got these wet roads. Why don't we finish up with the dragon here at the very end? And, you know, it seems like at the end it should be easier. And God spoke to my heart again and said, you know what? Before you get home, you're going to face the dragon on a regular basis. The serpent is out to destroy you, Mark. And there's going to be a lot of sharp turns, and sometimes the roads are going to be wet, and sometimes they're going to be treacherous. But if you will keep your vision clear, you see, I had to raise my visor to see where I was going. And although it was miserable, my vision was clear to see. And God began to speak to me and say, you've got to keep your vision clear so you can see. Even if you feel like it's miserable right now, you keep a clear vision. You keep your eye on the road. You follow my leading. And when the storm comes, I'll make sure you get through the storm and you're going to get to your destination. See, that's the message God wants a lot of you guys to hear this morning. Some of you are tired you don't want to be diligent anymore. Maybe you started out your Christian walk in diligence. You went. You did. And now you want to lay down. This is not the time to lay down. Even oftentimes when the dragon stands between you and that place called home. Because you see, the Bible says that God has defeated the dragon and will soon put Satan underneath your feet. You have victory in Jesus Christ. You are greater than any enemy that opposes you. God will see you through any storm that stands in your way. You be faithful to stay on the road and do what God has called you to do and look at the storms as a blessing. God, what are you teaching me in this? What is it you want me to learn? Paul said, I will rejoice in my infirmities. I will rejoice in my weakness. He said, because it's in my infirmities and it's in my weakness where God's strength is made manifest. That's where we trust the Lord the most. So guys, if that's where you are this morning, it's raining like crazy and you're crossing the chair hollow. God has a reason for it. He's got beauty in the midst of it. He's got reward on the other side. And if you'll be faithful, I guarantee you he will. But guys, keep your vision clear. Raise your spiritual visor. Mark, what do you mean? Listen, the smallest thing to block your vision can miss that log in the road or that turn that comes up too quickly. And if you've got some small sin in your life, you think it's a small sin, maybe it's only this, maybe it's only that, I'm only doing this, whatever it might be. Listen, your vision is gonna be impaired. And when you come to these trials where the twists and turns take and the storms hit, you know what? The ones who have their vision impaired are the ones who go over the cliff. The ones who have their visor up, they may be a little bit more miserable in the midst of the storm trying to see what's going on and trusting God, not complaining. God, I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. This is horrible, but I'm going to trust you. They're the ones that make it. They're the ones that have the victory. They're the ones that don't drive over the cliff because they can see where they're going. Guys, keep your visor up. Trust in the Lord. He has a reason for the storm you're in. He has a purpose for the road you're on. Stay faithful. If you've not been diligent, say, God, give me diligence. I want to be diligent. If you were diligent and you slipped a little bit in your diligence, then now it's time to come back. It's time to get back to the word like you used to be. It's time to get back to the prayer like you used to do. It's time to get back in serving like you used to do. It's time to be diligent for the things of the Lord because the clock is ticking, our time is short, and the reward is great. While our time at the table of God's Word is ending for today, please keep reading in the book of Acts. From the inspiring faith of Stephen, to walking through Paul's conversion, to observing how the early church grew and thrived, there's much more to gain from this eventful book. Jesus had promised to send a helper, and he certainly delivered in sending his spirit to overflowing in these new Christians. It must have been an exciting and also very challenging period of time that these men and women were getting to be a part of. If there was something in this message that you need to hear again, you can go to thewaymedia.net and navigate to Come to the Table to Listen to or download this or other messages. You can also download the Way Media app so you know when new broadcasts are happening. 
If you're a prayer warrior, we very much value your consistent prayers during this study through Acts. God can do mighty things through the faithful prayers of those who seek after Him. We're earnestly expecting Him to do big things in and through this radio ministry. We're thankful for your prayers, and we're trusting God to use this platform to get the word out and for it to spread like wildfire. Pastor Mark has more to share through the book of Acts, so we hope you'll be able to join us next time. We look forward to what will be shared about these people of faith and the trials and triumphs they faced as they walk out their lives in a way that sought to honor God. May these accounts inspire you to do the same and to come to the table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.